My name's Helena Gardner. I'm the co-director of the Fetal Cardiology Program at UT, working here at the Children's Memorial Hermann Hospital in Houston. We would like to welcome you to Heart Week, and through this webinar, we want to share with you some good news, that babies with heart problems can be detected before birth using ultrasound, and their care and deliveries planned to ensure that they get to surgery in the best possible shape. And once they reach our surgical team, they're in great hands. And the outcomes for most babies are very good. At this point, I want to allow Dr. Douglas, my co-host, to introduce himself. So my name is William Douglas. I am a professor of surgery at UT Health and the chief of pediatric cardiac surgery at Children's Memorial Hermann Hospital. So without further ado, I just want to say a little bit about fetal cardiology. I'm the one in the blue dress in this picture. I'm a trained fetal cardiologist, and I've recently joined our team of expert fetal doctors and surgeons. I've been a doctor for more than 30 years, and I've spent the last 16 years uh, developing the specialty of fetal cardiology. And this specifically aims to detect congenital heart disease before birth. So what is congenital heart disease? Well, it's a heart problem that occurs during the development early on in pregnancy. It's the most common congenital abnormality and accounts for at least a quarter of all the malformations we see in babies after they're born. And you might be surprised to hear that about 1% of all babies who are born have some sort of heart problem. Only about half of them are seriously affected, but these are a very important uh, group and they'll need surgery before they're a year of age, generally. You may be well aware of paediatric cardiology, but the concept of fetal cardiology may be new to you. And it's in part because it's a newer branch of perinatal care. The technology has helped to see the baby's heart and image it well through the pregnant mother. It can be practiced either by a cardiologist or somebody with obstetric training. It doesn't really matter, but the most important thing is that the fetal cardiologist works closely with a multidisciplinary team and that they believe that prenatal detection can help the most seriously affected babies with heart problems. What is it that we actually do when we're practicing fetal cardiology? Well, you may find that your obstetrician screens generally for congenital malformations and refers on to a maternofetal medicine specialist for confirmation of this. The cardiologist tries to make a very specific diagnosis of the type of heart problem so that they can provide the most comprehensive counselling to families who are expecting a baby with a heart problem. And at this point, we involve the whole team because we want to look at the management of the pregnancy, the care of the mother who is expecting the baby with the problem, the planning for delivery, we need to know where and when to deliver baby, and the the team that's going to be involved in looking after the newborn baby uh, need to be involved with planning, even from quite an early stage. And so, surrounding the baby and looking after the welfare of the baby, we have quite a team. It really starts with the obstetrician. You will mostly have the diagnosis made in the OB office. And it's here that we're going to direct most of our attention in terms of training. Once the diagnosis has been uh, suspected at an obstetric scan, you would be referred to a maternal fetal medicine specialist. And they will be able to look at the whole of the baby to see whether there really is a heart problem. And if there is one, is, it just, uh, is there just a heart problem or are other organs affected in the baby? The fetal cardiology team will work closely with maternal-fetal medicine in order to make this work well for the, for the mother. Sometimes things occur in families and we are very keen to involve our genetic counsellors 
to provide an overview for families, to help them understand whether there are any underlying reasons for this to have happened during the pregnancy. And when we have a good idea of what's going on, we involve all our team that will look after the baby after birth. And these include the neonatal specialists who will stabilize baby after birth, and the paediatric cardiologists who will help to refine the diagnosis and present the case in the best possible way to our cardiac surgical team. We would like to discuss all this for a family even before the baby is born. And we know also that babies who have other problems with other organs will need specialist paediatric surgeons. And so we will work together to try and produce a perinatal plan so that your baby and your family are looked after in the best possible way. This is a planning that we would like to take uh, time over and run through the second and third trimesters of pregnancy, provided there is a good diagnosis made. So I'm going to just describe the baby's circulation briefly and just show you four or five heart problems that I think may uh, be of interest to you and, rec and, and involve some important points uh, that I think we've brought up already uh, in the webinar uh, comments that we've seen on the website. So here's the normal baby's heart and Dr. Douglas is going to go through this in more detail. It has a blue and a red side, but very importantly for the purposes of prenatal uh, discussions, we're going to look at the baby's arterial duct. Because the baby's in fluid and the lungs don't have any air in them, the duct is very important to take the blue blood through away from the lungs, mostly, and bring them back down into the descending aorta and back to the placenta to pick up oxygen. A baby will often depend on this duct to stay open in order to remain healthy in the first few hours and days after birth. And the following uh, heart lesions that I'm going to show you depend to some extent on this staying open in order for a baby to maintain a healthy circulation. So one of the most severe is hypoplastic left heart syndrome. And you can just see by comparison with the normal heart that this has a small left side, a tiny aorta, and in fact most of the time there is no flow into the left pump or out of the left pump. Now the vast majority of cases of hyperplastic left heart syndrome are picked up by the OB office before birth. At least 70% I think will have a prenatal diagnosis and this is very important because this sort of circulation requires a lot of care during the first few days after delivery. We would want babies with this sort of heart defect to deliver near to the cardiac surgical centre. And I know many of you are familiar with pulse oximetry and its ability to pick up heart problems in the newborn period. But this is one of the ones that is not picked up well by pulse oximetry unless you know about it before birth, because the baby's duct stays open very often with these severe malformations, and the pulse oximetry cannot pick up this defect as well as it can for blue babies. These babies will present in a, a waxy um, white way with a poor uh, circulation to their bodies if they're missed in the newborn period. Now, similarly, coarctation of the aorta is like a little sister of hyperplastic left heart syndrome. It often has a slim left side. The red side is slimmer than the blue side. And usually the arch tapers down to a narrowed area. Now, this is much harder at the moment for the OB office to pick up. And this is where we're really concentrating our training to pick up these very important heart defects that aren't so easy to detect. Again, this is one where a baby may show no signs after birth when the neonatal team look at the baby and the duct is open for a few days. 
so pulse oximetry also may not pick this sort of heart problem up. So we really want to pick these babies up. At the moment, probably fewer than 10% of them have a prenatal diagnosis, and the babies can become very ill after birth if it's not detected. Now coming on to the bluer babies, Tetralogy of Fallow. This is a condition where there are usually two good pumps, a big defect between them, and the lung artery may be a normal size, but it may be very small. Now, if the baby has a good sized lung artery, the, the blood gets to the lungs after baby is born, and baby may not show any signs for several weeks after a child is born. So here is the large uh, hole between the two pumps and here is the lung artery. So if it's a good size, baby can be born locally if it's picked up before birth and baby probably won't get into much trouble in the newborn period. If the lung artery is small, this is the sort of defect that would be picked up by pulse oximetry after birth. But we would hope that in prenatal diagnosis, you could pick up the presence of the large hole between the two pumps and the much smaller size of the lung artery. Again, we're working on training in the OB office to make this a reality for people, because at the moment, only one in three of these babies are detected before birth. Transposition of the great arteries is another case where the babies are blue after birth. At the moment, perhaps 20% or 30% of these are picked up at the OB scan. We see the differences here are that the two big arteries, the body artery and the lung artery, are switched around. And the body artery comes from the blue side of the heart. This means these babies can be very sick soon after birth. A prenatal diagnosis is very important to provide them with the sort of care they need in those first few hours after delivery. And we would recommend that, that babies with this heart condition are delivered very close to a cardiac center. Because the little mixing doorway, the foramen flap, between the two collecting chambers might be very tight or closed in the newborn period and stop the flow of blood that comes back from the lungs escaping out and to the body. So transposition of the great arteries is associated with a very good outcome for children, but they can become very sick. Pulse oximetry will pick it up postnatally, but these babies have to be in a good centre within the first few hours after birth. So a prenatal diagnosis is very important for them. And lastly, another blue case, blue baby with pulmonary atresia. In this case, the baby has a small blue side, blue pump, and the pulmonary artery, the lung artery, is closed completely. So it's a little bit like hypoplastic left heart syndrome, but on the blue side. This is usually picked up by people before birth because this chamber is much smaller than it should be. And often the collecting chamber is very dilated because the valve is leaky. Surgeons will want to operate on these cases within a day or two after delivery. And again, we need our cardiologists and neonatal teams to be able to maintain the arterial duct in order for the babies to have a stable circulation before delivery. So we would like these sorts of babies to be picked up before birth and delivered close to where the neonatal teams and the surgical teams can manage them optimally. Again, because it's a blue condition, if it's missed at screening by the OB office, it can be picked up well by pulse oximetry. So this is a useful tool for the blue baby, but not very good when the obstruction is to the body arteries. So this is a roundup just of a few cases 
that we will be able to pick up before birth. Prenatal detection allows us to be able to put a baby into a safe environment at the time of delivery. So when do we scan? When would we like to know about a problem? Well, the 20-week anomaly scan is the ideal time to pick up a problem. So at your OB office, you want to make sure that they're looking at all levels of the fetal heart. And this is what we're training. At the moment in the Houston area, we're going out to offices and we're training the technicians who do the scans to feel more confident in picking up the problem. The mother then will be referred, or the whole family, to the fetal medicine unit for confirmation of this. And then we can offer the additional tests and counselling that I mentioned earlier. We will perform more ultrasound scans when you visit the unit. You might be with us for half a day. You'll have a general scan with our MFM specialists. You'll have a cardiac scan. We may order a magnetic resonance imaging uh, scan for you. Uh, genetic counsellors will talk to the whole family and often we'll have a roundup meeting counselling the family. A little later in the pregnancy, you'll meet the surgeons before baby is even born to discuss the sort of surgery that they will be able to offer. And of course, we know that we will refine the diagnosis after birth with the help of our paediatric cardiology experts. We have superb cardiac nurse specialists and they will help you through this journey to arrange for you to meet the surgeons to visit the neonatal unit. We don't do all this at one visit because it's a lot of information to take in, but we'll arrange for you to come back as often as you like to talk to the team and we'll discuss tests with you and with the family. Everybody will get a personalised delivery plan and we will discuss all the treatment that you need. We know that some people travel from quite long distances and they have other little children in the family that they need to look after. So just to round up then, the multidisciplinary team involves a lot of us. Your local OB is a very important part of this. Without their detection, you never get to meet all of us before birth. You never get the chance to have a perinatal plan and to know and understand about your baby's heart problem before birth. So we are working hard now within the Houston area and beyond to improve the training and the confidence of the community, everybody who practices obstetric ultrasound to empower them to pick up your baby should he or she have a heart defect. I think it's a good time now to transition over to Dr. Douglas for him to be able to talk to you about what he can do to help your baby after birth. Dr. Gardner, thank you very much. Like I said, my name is William Douglas. I'm the Chief of Pediatric Cardiac Surgery at Children's Memorial Hermann and a professor of surgery at UT Health. So I'm going to talk about what happens after the babies are born. So after the baby is born, the baby is transferred to the neonatal intensive care unit, uh, or NICU as we would call it. The word neonatal comes up a lot and essentially means newborn. So this is the place where all the complex newborns are cared for. The baby is stabilized, placed on whatever monitors are needed, and then completely evaluated. With rare exceptions, heart defects are not crashing emergencies. The nature of having the arterial duct um, that Dr. Gardner talked about earlier allows these babies to be stable initially and gives us the luxury of some time. Most heart surgeries are done on neonates between 4 and 14 days of age. By this time, we've had a chance to evaluate the baby, we've had a chance to talk everything over with the family. In addition, there are some changes in the blood vessels and lungs which take place over the first few days of life which make babies better candidates for surgery. Although there are some surgeries which are done from the side of the chest, most surgeries are done with an up and down incision, as you see here, through the middle of the chest, which is called a median sternotomy. 
This is a typical picture of an operating room scene. As you can see, there are a lot of people involved, and there are even some that you can't see. The typical case has a surgeon, an assistant surgeon, two anesthesiologists, two operating room personnel at the table handing the instruments, another operating room nurse circulating in the room. You can also see the perfusions in the foreground of the picture running the heart-lung machine, and that's a specialty in and of itself. The heart-lung machine keeps everything circulating throughout the baby's body while the heart is being fixed. You also don't see the pediatric cardiologist who performs the ultrasound on the heart before and after the repair to make sure that everything comes out okay. I'd like to talk a little bit about some sample defects that we fix just to give you an idea about some of the things that we can do. This is a picture of a normal heart that we can do that we can use as a starting point. The two upper chambers of the heart that you see here don't really do much pumping. The real pumping is done by the two lower chambers called ventricles. One pump pumps blood to the lungs here and the other pumps blood through this candy cane shaped blood vessel to the body. This is a picture of one of the simpler defects we fix. This defect is called a coarctation, and Dr. Gardner mentioned that, which is a narrowing of the aorta just after the branches that go to the head and the arms. The narrowing is fixed by actually cutting out the narrowed segments and putting the two good ends back together. This is an example of a more complicated defect called truncus arteriosus, or just plain truncus. In a truncus, there is only one blood vessel coming out of the heart instead of two. That big blood vessel gives off branches to the body, here, and to the lungs. In addition, there is a hole between the two pumping chambers. Repair involves closing the hole so that the left ventricle pumps blood to the body. The blood vessels to, to the lungs are removed from the big blood vessel and connected to the right side of the heart with an artificial tube, which is this large white structure. That tube, being artificial, doesn't grow, so babies who have this defect will have repeat surgeries to replace the tubes as they outgrow them. This example is of an interrupted aortic arch, and it's a good example of a defect that depends on the arterial duct. In interrupted arch, the aorta is actually in two pieces the lower body down here, and the, the, the aorta to the, to the upper body up here. The lower body only gets blood through the arterial duct, which is right there. These babies also have a hole between the pumping chamber. Surgery involves removing the tissue that, that, comp that, uh, that comprises the arterial duct, and then directly connecting the upper and lower parts of the aorta the hole between the two pumping chambers is closed. After surgery, patients stay in a dedicated intensive care unit for heart patients, and the scene can be a little hard to take for some families. The blanket is shadowing this baby's face for identification and privacy reasons. But even for babies who are doing well, as is this baby, there's lots of equipment around, so don't let this overwhelm you. This is typical for babies after surgery. I do think it is easier for families when they honestly know that many babies have their share of ups and downs after surgery. Remember that every baby is different, and some of these complex operations on six and seven pound newborns really push our medical know-how. But even when babies have their ups and downs, most do very well in the end. When babies go home after heart surgery, the care is generally pretty easy. Most babies do not need monitors. Most are only on a few medications. So there's relatively little special care required for babies after heart surgery compared to a baby without a heart defect. There are some exceptions that, that do need uh, more involved care. When we talk about results of heart surgery, we are unfortunately talking about the risk of dying from surgery. 
There is no way around it. Children's do di children do die after heart surgery, even in the best of hands. <clears throat> the overall risk from dying from pediatric heart surgery for all for, for all children under the age of 18 years of age is three to three and a half percent. But there are two risk groups which stand out, especially when they're combined. The first group is the neonates, in other words, children less than 30 days of age. The risk of dying for neonates is much higher than of older children, and even older, and the risk is even higher for children who are only three to six months of age. The other high risk group are children with only one functioning pumping chamber, as Dr. Gard, as as in the case that Dr. Gardner mentioned. In this case of hypoplastic left heart syndrome, the left side the left side of the heart is underdeveloped and doesn't really contribute to any of the pumping. Children with single ventricles who require surgery as a neonate are clearly the highest risk group we see, and some of these procedures have a risk of dying, which can be 15 or 20 percent or even higher. The good news is that most children with heart defects, even severe ones, live very normal lives, to the point where most people who know these children would never be able to tell that anything was wrong with them. A good example is a young man I will call Baby David. Baby David has a variation of the truncus defect that we talked about earlier. In addition, he had a narrowing of the blood vessel, as you can see here, which, which, uh, which uh, took blood flow to the lungs. Baby David needed surgery as a neonate because of the narrowed blood vessel to the lungs, and then he had his truncus repaired just before he turned two. When he was just four years of age, he needed a third surgery to replace a tube between his right heart and his lungs. And what was the family's biggest concern before facing a third open heart surgery? We can't keep up with him now. How will we do it when he feels better after surgery? Keep in mind, you are not alone. The world of pediatric cardiology and cardiac surgery are filled with the most caring, dedicated, and professional people you can imagine. At our hospital, for example, we have full-time cardiac nurses and intensive care unit physicians at the bedside 24-7, and specialists in cardiac anesthesia, perfusion, and all the different fields within cardiology available whenever your baby needs it. The facilities in this country are the best in the world, and everything will be done for your baby. Thank you for joining us today, and now we're ready to open up the floor to questions. So we have a question from Tiana. Could you please discuss transposition of the great arteries? Well, I think we can both do that, uh, can't we, uh, Dr. Douglas? I, if I just start with the prenatal part of it, Transposition is when the body artery comes off the blue pump and the lung artery comes from the red pump. And this means that before birth, a baby has a circulation that is uh, totally separated. Now, this doesn't matter while the baby's still in the womb because of the large arterial duct and usually because there's a communication between the two collecting chambers. So really, the big problems start soon after these babies are born. And they can start very quickly after the baby is born, and that's why we want to make a prenatal diagnosis. With training, various countries have shown that they can pick up at least 80% of cases of transposition of the great arteries in babies before they're born. Now, this is a remarkable achievement, and I don't think that we're there yet here in the USA, but we're working on this, and we probably pick up about one in three. So over the next few years, we'll be working hard to show the uh, screening sonographers 
how to pick up that the two big arteries are switched around in order to put baby in the safest possible place after delivery. So um, <clears throat> I can discuss the surgery a bit for transposition, transposition of the great arteries and it is one of the real success stories in pediatric cardiac surgery. As you can see with transposition, the problem is that the, the two blood vessels leading away from the heart are switched. The aorta going to the body, shown here, should come from the left side, but in transposition it comes from the right side. And the blood vessel to the lungs should come from the right side, and it comes from the left side. And so with the surgery for transposition, what we need to do is to switch them back, which is exactly what we do. We either divide the arteries in their midsection, and then we re reverse their positions and sew them into place. And that in and of itself is not too difficult. The difficulty in this surgery is the, are the coronary arteries. Now this is something that we don't, um, uh, we don't have a picture of for this webinar, but the coronary arteries are the two small arteries which feed the heart muscle itself with blood. We're so used to thinking of the heart as pumping blood we can't forget that the heart muscle itself needs its own blood supply. And these two coronary arteries will come off the aorta right as, as it leaves the heart. When you switch the blood vessels doing, doing the surgery for transposition, you switch, it above the, you switch it above the level of the coronaries. And so the coronaries, which come off down here, have to be switched separately. The coronary arteries in you and me, in an adult, are three to four millimeters in diameter. And babies are obviously much smaller. And so it's a very delicate maneuver to, to cut away these coronary arteries from the original aorta and then transfer them over into the new position. When this surgery was first done, this was often unsuccessful and there were many babies who did not survive the surgery for transposition. With time, our know-how, and this is throughout the world, has gotten much better to the point where survival after transposition surgery is 97 or 98 percent. And, and when, once, when babies have successful transposition surgery, they, they, they end up with a heart with two normal uh, ventricles, usually normal valves, normal functioning heart muscle, and these babies have an excellent prognosis. And unlike some other heart problems, they don't tend to have any extra problems with other organs or with their chromosomes. So the outlook for these children is one of the best, I think, isn't it, following mm -hmm. surgery? Uh, we have another question from Trinity regarding, uh, has your hospital performed or considered using the Melody valve in the mitral, in, in mitral valve repair? Uh, we have not done that yet. That is something which has come up, although we've not had a case where we felt uh, necessary to do that. Um, the Melody valve is a valve which is a collapsed valve, which is intended to be delivered by cardiologists minimally invasively in the cardiac catheterization laboratory. So the Melody valve is meant to fit through a tube the size of a pencil, which is delivered from the groin through tube up into the heart and then opened up with a balloon and set in position. Um, the, the Melody valve um, has been used in the mitral valve position, but it is really a last ditch effort. Um, most uh, valves which are made like a Melody valve, and what I mean by that is um, tissues made, uh, valves made from animal tissue like the Melody valve have a limited life uh, duration in the mitral position. And that's something which we would do if we felt we needed to um, in, a, uh, uh, in, a, in, a, in a uh, in a difficult situation. Um, but the longevity uh, is not enough to make us do it in a more routine case. So it's, it's always possible for the future, but at this time, no, not yet.
So um, Stephanie wrote a question, have you seen an increased incidence of gastroparesis associated with the nerves involved in the stomach and the heart? And I would say yes. Um, the, although it's a soft yes, in other words, this is a, an impression of mine and there's not a lot of hard documentation um, to, to prove this point. Um, but this is a situation where I would associate with uh, neonates who have aortic arch surgery. So when you do, when you, so when we're talking about aortic arch surgery, and let me switch to a different so, uh, slide. So when you talk about aortic arch surgery, you're talking about surgery on this portion of the aorta. And this, this portion of the aorta can be uh, narrowed and require surgery. Sometimes it's in the case of something relatively isolated, like a coarctation that's associated with a narrow, narrowing of the entire aortic arch. Or sometimes it's with an interrupted arch, as in this picture, which requires a lot of dissection, although the most uh, classic case is of hypoplastic left heart syndrome, where there is a consider where there is a considerable amount of uh, work done on the aortic arch seen here in order to repair the defect. This is very closely uh, associated with many of the nerves that go to the throat, the swallowing mechanism, and the foregut, and it is widely accepted that babies who have this kind of surgery have increased feeding difficulty after surgery. Um, the, this is something which usually resolves with time, um, but we see a decreased suck and swallow coordination after surgery. We see a greater incidence of reflux. We see a, greater, a decreased ability for these children to feed by mouth after surgery. It recovers, but it does take some time. And, and this is, um, this is really a necessary part of doing surgery on the aortic arch. And in the year 2014, we don't have a perfect way to avoid it. We recognize that the issue is there, and when we're doing the surgery, we, we try as hard as we can to leave the major nerves alone. Um, but the priority is to fix the blood vessels and make sure that the surgery has a good result from a circulation standpoint. And that inevitably means doing a lot of surgery around the vagus nerve and, and a lot of the nerves that go to the important swallowing mechanisms. Well, I think we've reached the end of the question and answer session now. We'd like to thank you all for coming along to the webinar and we hope you found it of interest. It has been recorded and will be posted on our website.